Hi everybody, I hope you are all doing okay and are staying healthy. Um, like I said in my intro video, I'm Ariana. I'm your graduate course assistant for this class and I am coming to you from my living room. Um, first things first, I have two small housekeeping items. Um, one, I am going to be available during our regular class period, also known as Tuesday and Thursday from 12.30 to 1.50 Central Time. Um, and I'm also going to be available uh, oh, that's going to be on the Discord server, um, and then I'm also going to be available on Zoom Fridays from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time. Uh, I encourage you to all ask questions and use the Discord as a way of keeping a sense of class community as we all attempt to learn from afar. And don't worry if you're in a far away or different time zone or have other commitments during these times, um, but you still want to meet up with me or talk to me, um, you can reach out to me directly via email and I promise we'll work something out. Um, the second point of business is you'll note that there's a short assignment uploaded at the end of this week's module. Uh, this assignment is due midnight on Sunday in your local time zone um, and just upload a Word document with your response and uh, I'm going to offer written feedback hopefully by the following Tuesday um, but just know that these are not going to be graded um, with a letter grade they're just going to be pass fail. Um, and you can always feel free to contact me with questions or concerns about the assignment via Discord or via email. Um, okay, so today I am really excited to be talking to you all about Diana Taylor's 2016 book, Performance. It's a momentously useful overview of the many issues and topics in performance studies, and I wish I had this book when I was an undergrad. Um, and, you know, if you haven't had a chance to finish the reading, I would recommend taking some time now to do that before watching this lecture. Okay. Um, so, right now, I would like you to pause this video and set a five minute timer for a short warm up writing exercise that you'll submit on Canvas when you're done. Um, these can be submitted as like regular text entries right in the Canvas form or by uploading a Word document. I don't have a preference. Um, a gentle reminder here check in and check out assignments really only count towards your participation grade and are not evaluated for anything other than their completion, which just means like they're pass fail. You either did it or you didn't. Um, and in these assignments, there's no need for citations or direct quotes. I want your answers to be in your own words. Stream of consciousness and note form are perfect. Um, the goal for these exercises is for you to get the gears turning, have some ideas on the page in whatever form they come. Uh, I aim to offer brief responses to these prompts via Canvas, but don't be alarmed if you don't receive a reply. Okay, timer set? Good. Today's check-in prompt is, after reading Diana Taylor's book, how would you define performance? Take five minutes now and brainstorm your provisional definition. Okay. Great. I really look forward to reading what you wrote. <sighs> so, what is performance according to Diana Taylor? On page 71, Diana Taylor writes that breaking norms is the norm of performance. And I've always turned to this phrase as a bit of a guiding light in trying to understand or capture what performance can mean. Instead of offering just one definition, Taylor offers us a constellation of what performance can mean and do. On page 39, she writes, performance is quote, a practice and an epistemology a creative doing, a methodological lens, a way of transmitting memory and identity, and a way of understanding the world." End quote. Taylor's axiom that breaking norms is the norm of performance appears in this constellation as she creates a definition through oppositions. She says that performance is an ontology and an epistemology. It's the doing and the done. It's the as if and the is. Let's break those down a little bit more. If performance is an ontology or a way of being in the world, she argues that it is also an epistemology or a way of knowing the world. If performance is the as if or the make believe, performance also is. Performances already shape our present reality and have the capacity to intervene and offer new constructions of the real. If performance is the doing or the now, of performance, it is also equally performance as an object or product collected and preserved, like as a record of the past. So what emerges from Taylor's definition is uh, what I'm calling little p performance. 
the idea that performance is a broad category of phenomena that extends well beyond what we usually call theater, and that performance is radically unstable and therefore totally dependent on its framing. It's really helpful to me to refer back to Taylor's creative use of typography in the first chapter's title. If you remember, she places these square brackets around the word performance, visually communicating her thesis that performance lies in the framing. Performance studies as a field could then be understood as the study and practice of framing. Thinking of little p performance helps us see the way that a theatrical proscenium visually frames stage action as performance, but also how this peculiar architectural feature frames the offstage that equally participates in the performance scenario. Little p performance can be applied to things that we wouldn't want to call theater like politics and protest, self-presentation and self-fashioning, and religious ceremonies and rituals. <clears throat> but in the larger context of performance studies, there are many folks who might disagree with Taylor's capacious definition of performance. In Unmarked, The Politics of Performance, Peggy Phelan writes that, quote, performance's being becomes itself through disappearance, end quote. So Phelan argues that performance only exists in the now and that any attempt to record or archive performance fundamentally alters it. Phelan defines performance as profligate, spending itself so thoroughly that it disappears into memory. Now, in Phelan's definition, performance is pure presence, and things like documentary writing or audiovisual recording threaten performance itself, like its true nature. In the end, I think Phelan's argument is ultimately more about framing performance as always anti-institutional, something that by virtue of its uncapturability, quote, clogs the smooth machinery of reproductive representation necessary to the circulation of capital. But what do we lose when we start to define performance as something that disappears? Rebecca Schneider raises this question in an article titled Archives Performance Remains, which was published in 2001. Uh, Schneider argues that orientations to performance as disappearance gained momentum in the latter half of the 20th century through performance and action art movements that, quote, challenged ob object status and refused the archive its privileged, savable original. So in the art museum setting, performance art challenged a strictly visual regime of art, as well as the concept that art's value lay in its objecthood, like as, as a, you know, like a painting like the one on the wall there that could be purchased and seen. Um, <clears throat> Snyder challenges this conception of performance by pointing out that oral histories and performances are, by definition, repeated and are sources of historical knowledge and sites of transmission. In her argument, performance is, quote, an act of remaining and a means of reappearance, end quote. Schneider's argument highlights the ways that performances continue to circulate through repetition and how performances often reside in the bodies of performers. Schneider ultimately takes issue with Phelan's attempt to frame performances radical potential as its ability to be remainderless. She argues instead that to regard performance as wholly disappeared as Peggy Phelan does follows rather than disrupts the cultural habituation to the imperialism inherent in archival logic. Diana Taylor takes up the relationship between performance and the archive in her book, The Archive and the Repertoire, Performing Cultural Memory in the Americas, which was published in 2003. Taylor's account of the archive foregrounds the Western imperialist preoccupation with written documentation and the consequent necessity of salvage ethnography, which is a, a movement in ethnography to preserve the objects and record the traditions of cultures perceived to be bordering, quote, extinction. This uh, salvage ethnographic impulse constructs ethnic memory, or the idea that some cultures should be exiled to the past, and perpetuates the idea that performance, oral traditions, and embodied memories are not in themselves means of cultural memory and transmission. So the ethnographic works that Taylor is discussing are often canonized as part of the ethnographic performance studies tradition that Leslie's going to talk with you more about next week. In the end, Taylor refutes this structure, claiming that, quote, if performance did not transmit knowledge, only the literate and powerful could claim social memory and identity. The persistence of indigenous and captive or colonized cultures, despite enslavement, genocide, and land theft, is testament to performance lasting effects. 
So Diana Taylor ultimately proposes the repertoire as a way of envisioning the remainders of performance that both keep and transform, quote, choreographies of meaning and constitute sites of embodied knowledge transmission. For Taylor, the repertoire enacts embodied memory, requires presence, and is a form of representation in which the past is experienced as the present. She ultimately argues for an understanding of the archive and the repertoire as in conversation. Together, the archive and the repertoire comprise a scenario, quote, a meaning-making paradigm that structures social environments, behaviors, and potential outcomes. By accounting for not only the physical location or scene of encounter, but also the actors at play, the formulaic structures and cultural memory transmitted via the archive and the repertoire, the scenario offers a way to understand the relationship between performance as done and performance as doing. This methodology forces us to situate ourselves in relationship to it. We are there, part of the act of the transfer. Ultimately, what I think Diana Taylor is gifting us in her book, Performance, is the ability to understand performance as something that is both located in the body, as well as something that persists across time through repetition in something like the repertoire. So before we move on, I'd like you all to set a short five minute timer and brainstorm answers to the following questions. Um, you'll find this in the week two Tuesday module on Canvas, and please remember that writing in note form is perfect. So, the prompt. What is one example of a performance archive? What practices do you engage in that, you, that might be part of a repertoire? Does the difference matter? Why? Great. Now for the rest of the book. Um, chapter two of performance offers us a look at the many histories of performance. Uh, while Taylor's focus is certainly on performance as it arises from performance art in the Americas, my main takeaway from this chapter has always been her assertion that the body is the medium of performance. On page 58, she writes, quote, no matter the scale of the event, performance is always mediated. The bodies of the artists, and of the observer participants reactivate an existing repertoire of gestures and meanings. Chapter three focuses more closely on this relationship between audience and performer. Taylor's example of Michel Melamed, I'm not sure if I'm performing that name, uh, performing, pronouncing that name right, um, Michel Melamed's performance piece, Regurgitophagia, in which every noise the audience make causes the artist to experience an electric shock, which you can see on stage by the flickering lamp um, that's like in the circuit with the artist. Um, well, this performance to me illuminates, and pardon the pun, uh, the reciprocal relationship between the performer and the spectator. It is as if in this piece, Melamed is asking, is there really such a thing as a solo performance? Or are our spectators always intimately involved in the action around them? So this performance allows Taylor to argue that spectatorship is prepositional. We are always spectators to, with, in, and of performances. So by this, I think that she means that, one, performance is always doing something to the audience. Two, performances are performed with an audience. Three, the performance happens in the audience both in the sense that performance happens in the body and mind of the spectator as well as on the stage, but I also think that she's talking to the to conceptual art or closet dramas that happen solely in the mind of the spectator and maybe also of the artist, but not at the same time. Um, and I think her last point here is that performances can be of the audience. And I take this to mean that some performances are made by the audience itself, um, like we might see in regurgitophagia. So Taylor reminds us that from Plato on, the position of the spectator is always politically inflected. Uh, in week five, we're going to explore the work of Augusto Boal and what he describes as spect actors, uh, which Taylor defines as, quote, people capable of acting and interrupting the performance or changing the roles they've been assigned, end quote. Uh, in particular, we're going to think about how we can develop our own performances that we're going to share online or somehow otherwise, 
um, and be particularly mindful about the roles we ask our audience to take on as we perform our actions. So uh, chapter four of performance focuses on an expanded definition of performance and, and in particular the use of the word performance as it is co-opted by neoliberal capitalism, thanks you Chicago, uh, to refer to a capacity for achievement, output and return, uh, which just kind of to me highlights the ambivalence of the word performance. I think so far a lot of the um, theoreticians that I've been talking about, and even Taylor herself, often attribute this radical or revolutionary quality to performance. But I think what's special about this book is that it does talk about how this term is co-opted by businesses and business organizations. Um, so on page 96 of performance, Taylor writes, quote, we must accept, however, that performance also functions within systems of subjugating power in which the body is simply one more product colonialism, dictatorships, patriarchies, and so on, construct their own bodies, end quote. So what's particularly useful to me here is the insight that complex systems, say like that of a patriarchy, which favors and ascribes value to male homosocial relations and creation over all others, creates bodies of their own that enact performances on and with other bodies. So the fifth chapter of this book offers a bit of a closer look at this interplay between cultural systems and embodiment, starting with performative language or language that does what it says, the famous example being from philosopher J.L. Austin's, uh, and it's the phrase I thee wed, which both is saying that I'm marrying you, but constitutes the act of marriage itself, or the oath of marriage. Um, but yeah, Taylor offers an overview of performativity as it relates to bodily performances that we wouldn't want to consider to be theatrical or part of a performance in the same way we would regard the actions of an uh, actor in a Chekhov play, for example. So in this chapter, Taylor helpfully designates performatic, the adjectival form of performance, as separate from the more specific language tool or philosophical tool of the performative, which refers to both the process of the body being acted upon by culture and the possibilities for action that the culture sanctions. We're going to dive deep into what performative means next, uh, next class um, and how it's used in performance studies, um, but I really want to highlight one thing from Taylor, and that's the concept of the animative. Um, in any moment of performance, there it's always at uh, Always at stake in any moment of performance, theatrical or otherwise, is the appropriateness of performance, of the performance. So Irving Goffman, which you're going to read for Thursday, will elaborate what it means to appropriately perform the self. But what's interesting about Diana Taylor's animative is that it seeks to describe the embodied actions, deliberate or not, that challenge social scripts and constitute political action. So before I offer my conclusion to this lecture, I'd like you all to take five minutes to brainstorm three to five questions you have about any of the terms we've discussed today. So this could include terms like performance, which was basically the topic of today's lecture, um, spectator, archive, repertoire, performative, animative, many others. Um, these questions can be about definitions, utility, like why do we use these words? How do we use these words? Basically, this is a space for you to write down anything that you're questioning or thinking about uh, from the reading and the lecture. Um, you can post and upload these to Canvas. So five minutes, go. Okay, one final point of business. Um, this week's writing assignment asks you to identify a performance listed in Diana Taylor's book that you would like to frame for the class. I'm going to model this assignment in the next lecture, um, but I welcome you all to start identifying a performance artist or piece you'd like to learn about from this reading and to start doing some research on it. Um, on the assignment page um, for that assignment, you'll see a list of helpful online resources that I've gathered already for you. But as always, you can feel free to email me or reach me on Discord with questions or if you're having trouble accessing any of those things. I know some of you might be in other countries and not sure what the VPN situation is like. Um, so feel free to reach out with questions. All right, so by way of a conclusion, 
as we begin to approach performance studies from our respective quarantines in a time when performance in person is dangerous because of the various ways the body serves as a media for virus and infection, I've been thinking a lot about what Taylor writes on page 104. Quote, Instead of seeing the internet as a means of fulfilling outmoded metaphysical desires of disembodiment, it offers, on the contrary, powerful individual and collective strategies for projecting body presence and extruding body awareness. The internet does not hasten the disappearance of the body and the dissolution of the self. Rather, it generates new collective physical couplings and a telematic scaling of subjectivity. Wow. I mean, to me, this is uh, makes me really hopeful for the creativity that our class might instigate. Um, and I hope that our creative assignments can help us think about how to use our bodies and the internet to think critically about performance, even if our more traditional or default venues for performance are not available to us. So I take this as an invitation to explore our telematics, <laughs> our telematic selves. Um, and I'm really excited to see what you guys write and make. Um, so yeah, I hope you all are staying well. Um, and as sane as possible given the circumstances, and I'll see you again on Thursday. Bye!